Hi, and thank you for watching today's video. My name is Sarah Joy, and today I would like to help those of you who just bought your first cello, you have no idea where to start or what to do. Before we begin, I do want to let you know that this video is sponsored by Tom Play. Tom Play is an online platform and app that features beautiful backing tracks that you can actually play along with and they have this huge library of sheet music that you can interact with um, through annotation tools. They have a looping function. There's an in-app metronome you can record yourself. So just a lot of really great tools to use in your practice time. And they are having a back to school sale. So if you're interested, you can find that link in the description below. And of course, not only will you gain access to all of these great things for your practice time, but you also help to support this channel and the content that I create. The first thing that I wanna talk about is setting up your practice practice space. And the first thing in this topic that I think of is having a good chair. This is really important because if you have a chair that's too low or a chair that kind of pushes you back like this, it throws off all of the angles. The cello won't sit properly between your knees and things just won't feel right. The second thing you'll need is a music stand. And of course you can make do with a more flimsy music stand, but if you get a more solid one, it's less likely to tip over and the pages are less likely to kind of fall off the edges. Next on the list, is a full-length mirror. It's so easy to think that your body is doing something, but it's actually not. So you think that your bow is straight, you think that your elbow is high enough, but then you look in the mirror and it's like your elbow's down here, maybe your shoulders are hunched, and things just aren't quite right. It's important to have an honest depiction of exactly what's happening. I would also recommend having a cello stand. This is not necessary, it's completely optional, but to get it out of harm's way, it's nice to just have your cello stand in the corner so you finish practicing, you put it up. Next on the list is a rock stop. This is what one of them looks like. I have a lot. This isn't my favorite kind. My favorite kind, um, they have the straps that you slip under one leg of your chair. Um, but this, this works fine most of the time. So you put it on the ground, you stick your end pin inside of it, and this keeps your instrument from sliding all over the place. And if you're practicing at home and you have carpet, you probably won't need this, um, but you never know where you're gonna end up playing, where they might have tiled floor or a hardwood. You never know. So these are really, really important to have. Next up, and this is um, a shameless advertisement for some notebooks that I designed. Um, these are available on Redbubble. And again, the link will be available in the description below. But yeah, I designed these cute little practice journals. They have some lined paper inside. And whether you want to use mine or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, so long as you have a journal um, to write down your progress and keep track of all of the things that you learn because you think it'll stick in your brain, but a lot of the time um, you just forget stuff. So write it down. Next up, you want rosin. Rosin is very important. You cannot play without it. This is the kind that I use. I don't know if you can see, but this is um, Larson Strings Rosin. Also, I have my cleaning cloth. This is from Beaumont Music. All right, moving on to the second thing that I wanna talk about. We're gonna talk about how to prepare your bow to actually practice. And as a side note, I would really recommend actually separating your two hands um, in terms of the beginning learning process. So instead of playing immediately with the bow, I would probably practice with the left hand, practice with the bow, and then once you feel comfortable, put those two aspects together and uh, you'll probably approach the combination in a more relaxed manner. You're not gonna overwhelm your nervous system. The first thing that you'll need to do is tighten your bow. This is what it looks like straight out of the case. This is what it should look like always when you aren't actually playing, very loose. Whenever you're getting ready to play, you're gonna turn the screw clockwise like this. And as you can see, the hair tightens and you start seeing that growing gap between the hair and the wood. I see a lot of students come to their lessons and their bow is over tightened. I'm gonna show you what that looks like so that you don't make that mistake because it's, it's not really good for your bow and it's not necessary at all. Um, you know, sometimes depending on the type of music that you play, there is a slight variation in the tightness of the bow, but this, this is too tight. This is very bad for your bow. So I'm gonna loosen it back and this is a pretty safe distance. This, this is good right here. Now, once your bow is tightened, um, this next part, actually, I had to include it in this video because I got several comments on previous tutorials where someone was saying, I bought this cello and I can't get any sound out of it. Like, what's happening? Is my cello broken? Did I buy something that was bad? No, you probably did not. Um, most likely what happened is that you bought a new cello 
the cello came with a new bow and the bow didn't have any rosin on it. If you don't have any rosin on the bow, then you're not gonna get any sound because what the rosin does, it's very sticky. And so when you put it on the hair, um, it causes the hair to grip the string. And once you grip the string, it starts the string vibrating. And a vibrating string is how you create the sound. So no rosin, no sound. To actually apply rosin, if your rosin is new, you'll want to take the screw, the end of it, the sharp edge, and scratch at the rosin just to kind of get it to where you can use it. Now, this is how you don't rosin. Don't do this. Bad, don't do that. What you want to do in one long, smooth stroke is go from frog to tip and then back. Now, the frequency and amount that you rosin your bow uh, really depends on how often and how much you practice. And I can't tell you exactly uh, what that ratio is. A good indicator to show you that you did put too much rosin on is if you go to play and then a little puff of rosin comes out, uh, that means you, you put too much on. Um, and if the sound is weak, if the string sounds very um, just soft and like it doesn't have any substance to the sound, that means that you should probably add more rosin. So just experiment with it and you will figure it out along the way. All right, so now that the bow is prepared for practicing, let's actually get the cello, pick it up, and see how it um, fits in relation to our body and our posture. All right, so here's your cello. You're ready to start playing. And the first thing you need to do is pull out your end pin. This is your end pin. Just here's your little screw. It depends on your height and your chair and whether you want the instrument more vertical or horizontal. When I say that, I mean like this or like this. All of that is going to be um, changed and affected by the length of your end pin. This corner right here on the left side of the cello, this is going to go basically inside your knee area. So right there. This curve right here, your leg is gonna fit right up against it. So here's your, here's your leg right here. The cello should be tilted just a little bit towards the right. So if I'm looking down like this, the fingerboard from my perspective is aiming a little bit off center to the right. We're going to start here, feet flat on the floor, angled this way, and this peg right here goes right here behind and slightly under my ear whenever I'm sitting up straight. Of course, whenever you really get into the music, kind of lean forward, but uh, whenever you're sitting up straight, this is pretty much what it should look like. Briefly, let me name the different parts of the cello. I'm not going to go over all of them, but just the important ones to know. So obviously these are your strings. This is your fingerboard, this long board right here, fingerboard. This is your bridge. This is your tailpiece right here. These are your fine tuners. And then these are your pegs. And this leads me to the next topic of discussion, how to actually tune the cello. These guys right here, these fine tuners, these are for fine tuning, right? So if your instrument is just a little bit out of tune, these are what we'll use. And if your instrument is really out of tune, you're gonna use these. And these are a little bit scarier um, just because they, they sometimes crack and they're stiff and they're hard to use at times. Um, but that's what you gotta do if it's way off. I know a lot of people are against using a tuner, but I think for beginners, it's useful just so that you have a visual representation of whether you're flat or you're sharp and, and correlating that to what you're hearing. It's like, all right, that, I didn't know that that was flat, but my tuner is telling me it's flat. So I know what that sounds like now. So I think a tuner is good so long as it doesn't become um, a crutch. I think an even better option is to use a drone. And this is uh, what I use for a drone. It's also a metronome. It's a little bit pricey, um, but I think it's worth it. And so what you do with the drone is you turn on a pitch. So this is A, I'm about to play A. Now A is the pitch that we want for this first top string. This is the highest string on the instrument. And when I play it, I want it to match this pitch right here. Um. 
it's close, but it's not perfect. That's the wrong way. So now I'm gonna tighten the string, go going clockwise with the fine tuner. That, that's good enough for now. So A is always the string that we tune first. Then we move to our next string, which is D. And um, it's always best to play two strings at a time. So A is set, we're good with A, and now we're gonna play D and A together and see if they blend, see if the intonation locks. That's good enough for now. Now we move on to G, we'll play G and D together. As you can tell, that sounds horrible. Not good. Our strings are tuned a fifth apart. So this right now, that's, that's not G. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can tell this yet, but it is very flat. So we are going to have to uh, turn the fine tuners clockwise to tighten the string and raise the pitch. That'll work for now. Then we can move on to C, C and G. That's actually fairly in tune, so I'm gonna leave it alone. If you don't feel comfortable tuning with the bow yet, that's okay. You won't get as accurate of a pitch if you just pluck the strings, but you'll get close enough that it'll work. It'll be okay. So one more time, uh, this is A as in apple. That's your far left string. String over is D as in dog. Here's G as in uh, garden. Here's C as in cat. So A, D, G, C. Also, one more thing before I move on. If you do have to use these whenever you're tuning, um, if you are tightening the string to avoid breaking the string or snapping the string, um, you want to loosen the string first and then tighten a little bit, loosen, tighten more, loosen, tighten more. Basically, just kind of let it stretch as you're working it towards where it should be because um, you do not want a string, especially a cello string, snapping in your face. Very scary. Um, yeah, not, not good. All right, I'm gonna bounce back to the bow really quick to show you in order how I would recommend you begin practicing. So first off, just with the bow, let's talk about how we hold the bow and then a couple exercises that we can do to kind of get our hand used to holding the bow. First off, here's the screw, like I mentioned before, here's the frog, this is the frog. Here, that little dot is the eye. This is the hair of the bow, do not touch do not touch the hair. Your finger oils will get all over it and mess up the sound. This is the stick and then here's the tip. My teacher showed me how to hold the bow by just flopping out my hand like this, very relaxed, where my thumb has a slight bend to it, my fingers are kind of curved into my palm, and then I just flip my hand over onto the stick. And my pinky lands on the dot, my third finger lands on the metal, Second finger just kind of hovers around somewhere. And then first finger, the bow, whenever I'm playing lightly, sits in this first joint. And whenever I'm playing more intensely, inevitably the bow will start finding its way to this joint right here. So this is generally what it looks like. And of course, there are many different ways that you can hold your bow. You have to adjust it to fit your hand. So if this doesn't feel right, if it's causing you tension, then you need to ask someone else, go watch some other tutorials and find what works best for you because you do not want to be sticking with something that's just going to cause you pain and frustration. Um, also, if you're a young person watching this video and you haven't really developed your muscles much yet, you can also scoot up your hand um, into this area. I suppose you don't have to be young, just basically if you want it to be easier to hold, if this feels too heavy, you can scoot your hand up here just for a little while to get used to that shape. Um, and then gradually, you know, you can 
move down here whenever you're ready. So this is your bow hold. Now, a couple exercises that I would start with is just this really lazy windshield wiper where you feel the weight of the bow rocking back and forth. You're not twisting your arm or your elbow. You are isolating your hand and your finger. You're isolating your hand and your fingers to be in total control of the bow. And really what you're gonna feel is this interplay between the pinky, the thumb, and the forefinger. This other exercise um, does a similar thing where you're just basically moving between these three fingers, thumb, first finger, and pinky. So you have the hair towards the ground or facing the ground. Um, and then you draw a little circle with the tip of the bow. So you're not doing it with your wrist. You're not going crazy like this. You're not doing it with your forearm or your shoulder or anything. You're just doing it with these fingers right here. You can draw a big circle, small circle, whatever you want to do. Uh, this helps with agility, um, just the looseness of your bow hand basically, getting you used to that. Now, to actually play on the instrument with the bow, still not adding in the left hand, what I would recommend is just some nice, long, open strings. So open strings mean that we are not using the left hand. So open A would be right here. And just see what that feels like. Now, I would recommend doing this in front of a mirror for this main reason. It's really easy to think that your bow is straight when it is not. On the A string, you actually want your bow, your hand to go out this way. Cause if your arm just does what it wants, look at how crooked the bow is right here. If I'm doing what my arm wants, by the tip of the bow, it's gonna be really, really crooked. It sounds terrible. You don't wanna saw at the instrument. You wanna gracefully start here, point out to have a straight bow. And then of course, come back on the up bow. Like that. And you'll know if your bow is crooked, if it starts dragging to a different part. So if I don't extend out, my bow just got dragged all the way down to the bridge. You don't want that. And then on the D string, same concept, but a slightly less intense angle. So you are gonna still go out, but not as much. G, you actually start going back behind you just a little bit. And then for C, you really wanna go back behind you. And the reason we have to adjust our angle is just because of the curvature of the bridge. So out, a little bit less, a little bit behind, more behind. A great way to practice keeping a straight bow, aside from what I just showed you, is to again sit in front of the mirror, check the angle of your bow, is it straight? Okay, place on the string, hold with your left hand. Now we take our right hand and we slide it along the stick so that we get used to tracing this path and you can do that on all four of your strings. The next bow exercise that I would do is very similar to what we just did. You're just gonna do big, long, open bows, um, but now you're gonna start experimenting in terms of placement between the edge of the fingerboard and the bridge. And um, what you'll find is that the sound naturally gets louder the closer you get to the bridge and naturally gets softer the closer you get to the fingerboard. And I don't wanna get too complicated with this right now, but just to throw this out there. The closer you get to the bridge, the slower and heavier you want your bow to be, and the closer to the fingerboard you go, you want your bow to be lighter and faster. And uh, just play around with those contact points on all of the different strings, and you're gonna feel the difference um, and, and what's required of you in terms of playing to get a good sound uh, between all of those different contact points and among the various strings. A lot of this comes down to experimentation and just getting used to it. Just do it over and over again and uh, you will become comfortable with those concepts. All right, I'm gonna put the bow down now and we're gonna go and just work on the left hand. And whenever we talk about the left hand, um, I need to explain how the, the notes actually work on the cello. Basically, in first position, 
across all four strings, we can cover two octaves pretty much on a keyboard. So here would be a C, then we gradually walk up, one, three, four, open G, one, three, four. There's the next C. If I keep walking up, there's the next C. So we have a low C down here, so that would be on the, the left side of the piano, low C. Here is an octave up, the next C. So we went up eight steps. Um, here's the next C, this is middle C on the piano. So middle C on the piano is finger two on the A string in first position. And C is the same note no matter where you play it, it's a C. It's just a matter of what octave it's in. So low C, a higher C, middle C, and so on. There are more C's up here. Um, now to actually find first position, um, you're gonna need to understand what a half step is and what a whole step is. A half step is the smallest interval, the smallest distance between two notes that we have in Western music. So you can get into quarter tones, but we don't really deal with that in uh, Western music, basically. Um, so a half step would be, let's say, open A. Smallest step you can go is up to B flat. A, B flat. Half step. Going up another half step would be B flat to B. Two half steps put together create a whole step. So from A to B is a whole step. A whole step up from your open strings with finger one, this is finger one, two, three, four, finger one, that's where first position is. So A up a whole step, finger one on B, that's first position. D, E, first position here. All of that is in first position. And the easiest scale to start with in first position, especially if you just wanna play on the top two strings, would be D major. Now, I don't wanna get into all of the theory as to why D major has two sharps, but if you're interested in looking that up, I would recommend looking up the circle of fifths. Here's D open, finger one on E. Now, next up, if I played a finger two, that would just be F but we want F sharp, so I'm gonna play three instead. So open, one, three, four on G, open A, one on B, three on C sharp, four on D. So we went from a D to a D, which is one octave. So this is a one octave D major scale. Super easy, you can practice just with the left hand at first, and then apply the bow later. So let's do it together. Here's D, E, F sharp, G, open A, B, C sharp, D. And there you go, one octave D major scale. And a great way to build strength in your left hand is to actually tap out the notes without using your right hand to pluck and you'll kind of hear the pitches come through. What you don't want to do is hit the note and then squeeze and just squeeze like this. That's not so good. Um, you want to tap and release the pressure. That way you don't get in the habit of really tightening up your, your fingers and your forearm and you want to avoid all tightness. But it is a good way to build strength. Um, yeah, so that is how I would practice the left hand at least right now and I would say the note names as you go. And then once you're comfortable with that, add the bow. Once you've got that, then I would recommend buying uh, Suzuki Book One. And what I really, really like about Suzuki Book One is that it doesn't like start off really easy and then two pages later, it's just crazy difficult. It actually takes you through very slowly, very carefully. It has you playing mostly between the D and the A string for quite a while, uh, just to get used to the bow and staccato, different types of bow strokes that there are. And get you used to switching strings. I think that's it. I hope that that is a good foundation to get you through everything. I'm sure I forgot something. I wrote down notes, but if I forgot something, 
those of you who have been playing for longer, please put those in the comment section below. One more thing that I wanted to mention before I end this video, I just wanted to let you know about this fun project that I've been working on. It's called um, Music Journal on my YouTube channel. It's just a playlist of all of my original songs that I've been writing recently. Uh, they feature the cello mostly, but I've been playing around with a lot of different instruments and I'm really happy with them. I'm happy with how they're coming out. Uh, so yeah, if you would like to listen, you can go find that playlist. Again, it's called Music Journal on my YouTube channel. And I hope that you enjoy what you hear. And okay, I'm done. That's it. No more. Nothing else to say. I hope this video helped you and uh, stay tuned for my next video.